So welcome back from lunch. Hopefully you all got some sunshine, got to network a little bit. Um, this is the session on what's coming in Data IQ 11. Um, there is another session running with the hands-on lab. So if you want to know about what we're going to release in the next couple weeks, you're in the right place. Um, by way of introduction, you might have recognized you saw me over here wearing a teal shirt earlier today. So I've had the pleasure of speaking with many of you already. Um, for those of you I haven't spoken with, my name is Christina Shao. I'm in product marketing here at Dataiku. And even if we haven't met, you probably have heard my voice in your dreams, in your nightmares, because if you close your eyes, you can hear the Academy videos running right now, right? So this is who I am. I do the demos, some of the, the feature videos online, and so forth. Before we dive into what's coming in our next major release, um, I want to do a quick recap on what our current version offered. We released it at the end of last year, so hopefully by now all of you have had a chance to play with it, try some of the great new features. You may recall that we focused a lot on MLOps and the model evalu evaluation store, the model comparisons, um, MLflow model import that came in our current release. We have um, the whole govern module to really start to dig into AI governance and to give leaders, project managers, program managers that oversight over the entire portfolio. And we also offered a lot of accelerators in Data IQ 10. So hopefully you've had a chance to go up to the seventh floor and see the presentations on business solutions. We have them across every vertical industry as well as for horizontal use cases. And we continue to release those every month, not just with major cycles. And in Data IQ 10, we also gave accelerators like workspaces to help users get access to their data assets more easily and new geospatial capabilities and so forth. And so with Data IQ 11, we continue to build upon those themes, MLOps, governance, accelerators, by enhancing those features I just talked about. But we also offered a ton of new features. So the goal is to empower everyone, as always, from the most technical experts at your company to the citizen data scientists, the tech savvy knowledge workers in the line of business, all the way up to the executives and leadership. So with Data IQ 11, we have kind of three main themes to help you have a mental framework for all these features that you see lift, listed be, uh, beneath. The first is to really cater to that most expert audience at your company. So think of your, your advanced data scientists, your ML engineers, your data engineers, the folks who typically are code first. We offered a lot of new tools for them and, and uh, ways that they can be more comfortable working inside of Data IQ without sacrificing the way they like to code. And the goal is to really reduce their technical overhead, setting up infrastructure, connecting to environments, manually logging experiments, so that they can more seamlessly kind of collaborate with their peers on projects. We want those folks to be working on the moonshots and not spend a lot of time on the mundane tasks. Oh, I'll go back. Second, uh, the folks in the line of business and the citizen data scientists. We have a whole bunch of new visual tasks to help them go further. So advanced analyses like visual time series, forecasting, outcome optimization, even computer vision, so that they're not blocked by not having the tooling or the, the coding expertise to do domain-specific use cases. And then lastly, of course, nobody wants to be in the midst of an AI gone wrong story in the news. And so we continue to beef up our govern capabilities so that you can uh, have standard workflows across all types of data IQ projects, whether or not they have machine learning, um, and added documentation and new types of stress tests so that you can mitigate risk in putting models in, into production. So we'll be diving into what you see here down below in just a moment. But there's a whole bunch of other capabilities I don't want you to miss uh, for our business users, the people who may mainly use dashboards and charting and uh, workspaces. We've given them you know, pivot tables on steroids, new filters for dashboards, new, new display labels to make their lives easier. Uh, for specialists, continue to expand in geospatial new goodies in the auto ML capabilities, so custom metrics, new algorithms. And then we haven't forgotten our friends who administer Data IQ. These are the, uh, the cloud architects, the admins. These folks have new tools to help them do Kubernetes cluster management, faster deployment on Google, Google Cloud Platform to add to our portfolio of AWS and Azure deployments. So a little bit of something for everybody. 
If you've been doing the math, you can see there's about 25 bullets, and I have 30 minutes. So I'm definitely not gonna be able to cover everything. At the end, I'll show you where you can learn more, where on the website, and I'll also be on the seventh floor to handle some questions. So let's jump into that first theme. Uh, I mentioned that we really wanted to serve our technical community, our code first users. And so we, we wanted to bring their favorite IDEs into the projects so that they're no longer disconnected. They also have the option to uh, you know, work in JupyterLab or VS Code right within a Dataiku project, but have all the admin and security and connections set up for them automatically with an Elastic AI backend. So I'll show you Code Studios in a moment. For folks who love the idea of these sessions and the experiment tracking that we have in our visual ML, but don't actually want to use visual ML, they want to code their models by hand, maybe in a notebook or an IDE, we've uh, extended our ML flow integration so that you can run those experiments in a notebook and still have all of the artifacts, the performance metrics, and so forth logged for you so that you can quickly compare, pick your best model. Feature store. Um, we always had the ability to kind of create these beautiful gold data sets that we hope other people will reuse. But there wasn't a place until now where you could kind of put them in a library of golden data sets and say, these are our best reference data sets for our data science peers to pick up and use in their own projects. So now we have a central feature store um, to add to all the other capabilities we have for data set management, feature management. And then lastly, um, this one kind of spans the citizen data scientist Persona as well, because we see um, even deep learning being out of the reach of some advanced data scientists who, who aren't experts in maybe TensorFlow or Keras, but want to do computer vision, which has been a little bit commoditized. So uh, anyone can really now take images. We have a full labeling task I'll show you to help annotate those if you don't have labeled data. And immediately, we can use pre-trained models to train deep learning models for object detection and image classification. So this one's a pretty big, hefty one. I'm gonna show you some demos here. For most of them, I'm gonna try live, even though we know the Wi-Fi has been very problematic. Um, so I'm gonna do a little bit of a mix of some pre-recorded, and I'll talk over it, and some live. So what we're looking at here to start is a flow with a Python recipe. And hopefully you're all familiar with code editor that's built in and native, as well as the Jupyter, lab, uh, the Jupyter Notebook integration. But now we have Code Studios. And so when I click in the Code Studios menu, I have some preset options for Jupyter Lab, R Studio, VS Code, Streamlit, which we'll talk about in a moment. So if I'm a coder and I want to work on that Python recipe but not use R editor, I would open a Code Studio. And now it looks just like VS Code. I have my extensions that I like. I have access to my recipes, in this case, my Python libraries. And I can freely edit these using any code linting type of, you know, the skins, whatever it is that you like to do when you code in VS Code. So autocomplete. If I hover over these things, I get the auto docs. So these might be useful to those of you who like to code and use the APIs, and you can do debugging with breakpoints, run recipes line by line, if this is your preference instead of Jupyter. Now, when I sync this back, if I go back to the Python recipe, just like I had coded it here, you see those lines appear. So seemingly trivial, but it makes it more familiar if you're used to coding in a, in a certain IDE. Now we also host, you can create custom web apps, you can use um, HTML and JavaScript and CSS and code it kind of by hand, or you can use uh, Dash or Bokeh or R Shiny packages, but let's say that instead you wanna use Streamlit visualizations. Well, we have a template that you can use here. Again, a code studio has your code on one side and dynamically you can see what the web app's gonna look like as you code it. So this is the development environment. When I'm done, I publish it, and it becomes published as a web app, just like any other web app developed natively. So that's Code Studios. That has a Kubernetes backend, so it's gonna run fast, it's gonna run uh, distributed. 
actually, what I'll do is I'll go into DSS. And if you have um, used the visual ML capabilities, you understand that we have these really handy things to compare sessions. We have this table view. We have model comparisons. These are things from Dataiku 10. And this allows me to very quickly, every time I hit train, capture those artifacts and do a side-by-side -side comparison of old, new models, whatever. But a lot of people would rather be doing model training like this. Okay, we're using APIs, we're doing everything programmatically. Here we have a notebook where I'm defining some parameters, and I've got a cell block here where I'm running. And so what sometimes people do is they, they run it and then they print out the results, they screenshot it, they write it down, in some way log it, and it's not super efficient and other people can't really see the results of those experiments. So what we've done is we've used that MLflow experiment tracking integration, and now every time I run this behind the scenes, if I go here to experiment tracking, they're being logged. So this is each time I've run it. If I scroll over, I can kind of see, well, they have different hyperparameters. You can choose which metrics you want to log. You can alter these displays. But now anyone can kind of follow the logic of why you picked the model you want to deploy in the end. And when you come to the point where you say, well, let's make this a safe model so that we can monitor it, govern it, deploy it the way we do all of our prediction models, visual, you know, visually derived or programmatically derived, I can either use this quick deploy here, or again, if I go back to my notebook, you can just do it all from code. In either case, oh, that's not what I want. In either case, you end up with that save model object, but you see that, that familiar train recipe is gone. So this is just another way to get a save model into Dataiku, even if it's developed outside. Now, it, it stands to reason that as data scientists will be building things that they'll come up with data sets that are really useful for other people. They've joined them, they've cleaned them, they've enriched them. Why don't we make it available to more people? So when I click on an object that I want to promote, I come over here, I publish it to the feature store. Confirm that. So now it's a feature group, and if I go to this central feature store, you can see here all the data sets that people have promoted as feature groups. Looks kind of like the catalog, but it's only the ones that are special and have been vetted and in some cases in, in regulated industries. Maybe these features have been approved and people can browse the schema. They can look at the feature in context and then just share it into their project. And this takes advantage of some of the new seamless sharing capabilities I won't have time to share today, uh, to show today, but it makes it easier for you to expose objects that you know other people will want to steal and borrow into their projects without having to ask you and have you explicitly grant access to share those objects into their projects. So that's the feature store. And let's see, do I have time to show, you guys wanna see the deep learning, the labeling stuff? I see some nods. It's really cool. Um, so I have some sample data. Let's say I'm doing an object detection task. In this case, the data looks like this, and the job is to identify personal protective equipment and what kind. Are they wearing a helmet? Are they wearing face protection? Are they wearing gloves? You can see how this would be useful on a job site for compliance. So as the leader of an annotation project, maybe I outsource, outsource this to Mechanical Turk, maybe I have to get my in-house experts to come and label data. It's always a little bit challenging to use open source tools, ship it out, get the labels in the right uh, format, and then model with it. So it's all in one place in this visual recipe. Here's my data. Here are the classes that I want them to be able to mark up, directions, how many labelers have to hit an image and annotate it before it's considered done for consensus purposes, and who's allowed to do it. That's the task setup. And then individual labelers would come in here and they would do their thing, right? Can use the keyboard shortcuts, that's hand protection. That's visibility clothing, save next. So that's the experience of, of an annotator. 
And as the reviewer, I can come in here and now I can see, okay, I've got people who gave these different labels. The objects didn't overlap enough. I need to resolve them. I need to select one. This one's good, that one's not. So it's all baked in here. In the end, you end up with a nice um, array with those bounding boxes marked up. And I'll actually show um, image classification. I have, let's say it could come from the labeling set or it could come from pre-labeled data. We have a new visual task for deep learning. And just like you would expect, we have the design interface where you go and you say, here's my train and test split, here are the metrics I want to optimize for, all of your deep learning settings set in here. So you don't have to code it. There are some defaults for you and you can even do data augmentation on images. Okay, to beef up the diversity of your training samples. Assign your GPUs, your infrastructure is all done and then you hit train, and as you would expect, when I explore a specific output, we can review the results. We can look at type one, type two errors, and we can even do what if analysis. And this is kind of fun. I'm gonna attempt fate here and see if I can, let's see if my Wi-Fi, uh, let's put a couple, let's put like a couple good ones and a couple bad ones. You can even do what if analysis for interactive scoring on images. So, we said there was a defect here. It actually is a defect. Again, good prediction, good prediction. So, what if analysis, just like you do for regular prediction models now on images? So, that's some of the teaser on kind of the coder first or data scientist features. Let's go back and talk more about folks who might want to do forecasting. Maybe they're finance analysts or marketing analysts and they are doing Excel forecasting or they're shipping it out to a third party forecasting tool. And we have a task so that you can not only do interactive statistics on, on temporal data, but you can also model it with that same design result uh, framework and the same deployment and monitoring framework. Seamless sharing we talked about, you now can um, expose objects into like a pick list people can see and if they find it in the catalog they can just add it to their projects and you can turn on limited visibility so that more of your projects are discoverable when people search terms. They might not be able to, to change it but they can see it and then if they can have uh, request workflows kind of like Google, hey I, can I get access to this, here's the reason why and there's a kind of an inbox to manage those requests. Outcome optimization, this one's really fun for decision support. So with what if analysis like I showed, it says given these inputs, here's the prediction. But the more useful question is what should I do to make the outcome what I want? How do I influence the outcome that I care about? And so with outcome optimization, um, it kind of spams the model to say given this reference record, here's the best set of inputs that lead you to the outcome that you want. And then for lastly, visual logic, if you have ever been in Dataiku and in the prepare recipe and you've written a really long nested if then else statement, you're gonna love this. I see some nods. Um, it gets really confusing really fast when you do a really long nested statement. So we have um, switch case processors, uh, a new formula, and we also have a nice little visual framework to build conditional logic so that you can have if then else groups and even better, it's not just the prepare recipe, it's every place in Dataiku where you see a filter menu. So pre-filters, post-filters, sort all the SQL recipes. You can build these very complex business logic and, and you know, embed your domain expertise in that way. So let's take a look. Okay. This is time series forecasting first, so you can see here some new um, objects in the tray. You see deep learning, but you also see uh, time series forecasting. So in this example, we have uh, airline stock ticker data. So all you need for the visual time series forecasting is a date column, your target column that you wanna forecast. In this case, we have, a multi, uh, we have multiple series. So here we have American, Delta, and United Airlines adjusted stock close price. Hopefully you all know about charts. It's kind of the first place you go to say, is there a trend? Is there some kind of visual pattern? 
But to go beyond that, we can now do like some pretty hardcore statistics using this new uh, interactive statistics card for time series. Stationarity, trends, autocorrelations. So I added all those cards to this page so you can kind of see what those look like. So when your data is prepared, in the lab, add a visual time series, forecasting model, as always, you select your target and your date feature, and then we have templates, just like for regular predictions. Statistical, deep learning, your choice. In design, you can set your forecasting horizons, your parameters and time steps. Uh, quantiles, I don't know how to get this thing to go away. I want tempt fate. Um, this is kind of fun. So resampling is quite common to have to do um, if your data is not Equus-based. So let's say you need to extrapolate or interpolate your time series data. It's already built in here with different options. Uh, and my favorite part about this are those little text values that explain what's happening when you, when you make that selection. And then on the right, I chose cubic so you can kind of see the shape of that um, interpolation. So that's quite nice uh, to understand what's happening. If you have external features out into the future, you can use them in your model. And we have traditional statistical forecasting methods as well as some deep learning ones built in. So we would train and then as you'd expect, pick a single algorithm to go and explore more. Uh, if we go to the forecast values, you can see the trend lines for each series that we specified, and you can kind of turn on and off the confidence intervals, explore them that way. So the best part about this is that you deploy it exactly the way you would a prediction model. Uh, you govern it the same way. It's just one other type of analysis you can do. Okay, next, outcome optimization. So this is what-if analysis. Hopefully all of you have played with this by now, and you kind of you know, interactively drag your inputs and see what the prediction will be. In this case, the goal is to say what the song characteristics are that will lead to the, the highest hotness score, which is like the popularity uh, rating of the song. So there's too many, there's, this is not even that many features, but you can imagine like, oh, this length, this tempo, this beat, there's so many combinations. How do I know what's going to maximize the hotness of this score? How can I change it so it's gonna be a hit single? So I clicked on that op outcome optimization button, and here I'm gonna maximize for the hotness score. Given, given what the song looks like today, what small tweaks can I make to make it as successful as possible? So here you can turn on or you can turn off features because not all things you can change. Not all things are feasible to change, so I can freeze features or, or activate them. And I can also put some constraints in. So in this case, I don't want a song that's too long uh, it won't play on the radio. If it has too long of a fade in or it's not fast enough, it won't be popular. So when I optimize, it gives me the paths from that reference record that will lead to the highest hotness score possible. And down below, it gives you kind of a plausibility score so that you can say, well, 90% plausibility means that the training data actually looks a lot like that. Those are small changes I need to make, whereas like a 50% or 10% plausibility means I could get something high, but I've got to change a lot. Data doesn't really look like that. So you can make a lot of business decisions using this type of, uh, of outcome optimization tool. Okay. Lastly, um, we added some new capabilities to the govern module, which you may know is, um, think of it as like a, a control tower for all your data IQ projects where you can say, these are very high risk. We need to have a standard workflow. We need to have sign off and approvals before it reaches you know, live production. We can do that for analytics projects now as well. We do bundle registry and bundle management so that as your, your workflows change, and maybe it's an ETL or an analytics workflow, you can say, okay, somebody needs to sign off on this before we just go and rip and replace uh, a complete project that maybe is used for very high level dashboards. Uh, flow document generator, I'll show you, flow document generator, I'll show you, um, is a lot like the model document 
generator that hopefully you found, which gives you this nice Word document with all of your settings, your outcomes. Um, it's a really great way to not spend time documenting things each time you make changes. And then stress tests uh, are a model view. So this is a plugin that you install, and when you're in the model settings, um, you can systematically corrupt the data to simulate problems that you foresee might happen in production. So you say, what's gonna happen to my, my model if, if these uh, features that are important are missing? Or if they change because of ambient conditions? If everything multiplies by this number because of temperature, is my model robust enough to handle that kind of change? So you can, you can do those perturbations before you put them live, mitigate the risk. So I'll show you stress tests here. So again, in any of the, the saved models or in the lab, when you enter in, hopefully you're getting very used to this particular screen, the stress test center. There's different types of corruptions you can use. So maybe you expect your target distribution to shift or a feature distribution. How do you want it to shift? Which, which class do you think is gonna change and how? So you can construct these simulations. Okay, have missing values, coefficients. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna run each of these tests independently, each of these corruptions. And it's gonna give you what your performance metric was in your original test set and what it'll look like with this corruption. So the idea is that this might be something along with bias and fairness checks that you do prior to deploying a model. And it could be part of like a, a standard workflow, a check, you know, as part of governance workflow as well. So this is model stress tests. Um, where is my browser? Here we go. If I go back to the flow, here's where you'll find the model documentation. It's right here, export documentation. We provided a, a Word template, that's the default. You can alter it to have your own company's font and colors and um, formatting with the placeholders. All I, and then you upload it. And so once I hit export, it'll create something like this. This is really small, but you can see here a project description. It gives you a picture of the flow. For each data set, it gives you information about its freshness, its size, who altered it, its schema, and so forth. So you can imagine how long it would take you to document this for a point in time, say after a version change. This can be automated. So in a scenario, maybe you retrain or you rebuild and then you re-export a document. So you can do this programmatically, it can be automated. But this is a big time saver and big part of the governance uh, theme. Okay. So, that was not nearly enough time to talk about these features. I don't expect you to remember almost everything I said. So, don't worry, if you go to our website under the products, uh, product update page, I have 10, 12, maybe three minute videos going through each of the key features in a little bit more detail. Um, we have a blog put out and pretty soon, I think within about two weeks, you should get an email or a notification from your customer success manager that DataIQ 11 is here uh, and you can try it out. You can go on the, the trials page, you can test it out. And um, what I will say is I will go upstairs after this to the seventh floor. If you haven't checked out the demo stations area, that we have technical experts up there who can talk about all kinds of interesting topics and I'll go up there and hang out. So um, if you have other questions about Data IQ 11, we would love to talk to you about it. I'm on time. Thank you.